Let's open our Bibles to Galatians chapter 2. Galatians chapter 2. Galatians chapter 2. I'm going to ask if you'd stand with me this morning. Galatians chapter 2. And I have, uh, I'm just going to be reading two verses here, verse number 20 and 21. I think I need more volume than this. Twenty and twenty-one. Here we go. <laughs> Galatians chapter two, verses twenty and twenty-one. The Bible says, "I am crucified with Christ. Nevertheless, I live. Yet not I, but Christ liveth in me. And the life which I now live in the flesh, I live by the faith of the Son of God, who loved me and gave Himself for me." I do not frustrate the grace of God, for if righteousness come by the law, then Christ is dead in vain. And certainly Christ is not dead in vain. Righteousness comes by Jesus Christ. And to this morning, the title of my message is, If Christ could completely use my life, what would he do? If Christ could completely use my life, what would he do? Let's go before the Lord. Lord God, we thank you for this opportunity we have to come before you this morning to open up the Bible and to hear the preaching and teaching of your word. God, I come before you knowing, Lord, that I can do nothing in the flesh to please you. That, God, we are trusting in the power of your Holy Spirit to work in our hearts through the word of God, through the preaching of the word. Lord, help us to examine ourselves today. This is quite a testimony of Paul, quite a thought to bear out in our own hearts. Lord God, help us to think about these things and to see what we could be if we would simply completely yield ourselves to you. God, I pray that you would use me as your servant here this morning. I pray in Jesus' name. Amen. You may be seated. This passage of Scripture has been one that I know I've referred to many times, and we often refer to this passage of Scripture. Paul was a very dedicated believer. He's very dedicated in the Bible. We see his testimony throughout the book of Acts and how God used him. We hear about him, and we see how the Holy Spirit inspired him to write many of the books of the New Testament, and we see how God used him in a mighty way. And I think a lot of times people really do not grasp how where Paul came from and how much of a change there was in his life in his conversion and that really one of the things about Paul that we should understand is that Paul was a person that persecuted Christianity in other words he hated Christianity so much that he was willing to kill Christians, he was willing to lead people to arrest Christians, he was willing to go to the political leadership of his time and go to them to acquire permission to also go to Damascus, another large city in the region, so that he could just go there for the simple task of persecuting Christianity there. And when you stop and think about this, you know, sometimes I have people say, well, pray for this person or pray for that person, uh, that they come to know the Lord or that they get saved, and they're a good person. I really hope they understand. And then you get that person, oh, pray for this person. I just can't imagine them ever getting saved, but just pray. Paul was one of them. Paul was the guy. Who is the most difficult person you can think of today? Who is it? That if you think about this person, this is a person that would be happy to kill Christians. That was Paul. 
He thought he was saved by his own religion. He thought he was saved by his own good works. He had a faith that was steeped in tradition. And he hated Christianity. But God was working in his heart. God was convicting him. I personally believe it's not written in the scriptures. And there's nothing necessarily to make us think this way. But I personally think that when Paul sat there and took the, held the coats of the people, when they stoned Stephen, I personally believe that that whole event influenced Paul. It was one of the things that God used to impress his heart. And I believe that as he was persecuting some of these Christians, the peace that they had and the way that they responded to persecution was something that he knew he did not have was something he knew that was not a part of his life. And I believe that that also really impressed him. And God was convicting his heart and using the testimony of these people to work in his heart. Jesus addresses the persecution that he had for him. You know, when people persecute Christians, they don't persecute us, they persecute Christ. When people stand against Christianity, they don't stand against us, they stand against Christ. I've had times when people did not like the preaching of the word. They'll, they'll say things like, well, you can't say you've got the only way. Jesus is the only way. And when people deny that, and when they hate that, or when they decide, I, I don't want to hear your preaching because I don't want to hear that kind of preaching, they're not standing against me. They're standing against Christ. Here's a man that when God got a hold of his heart, God got a hold of his heart all the way. And he, be, he went from the utter lowest to the uttermost in his dedication for the Lord. And so I want to look at some of the motivation of Paul, first of all. And I want you to look back in chapter 1. And I want you to see here in verse 13 and 14. He says here, For ye have heard of my conversation in time past in the Jews' religion, how that beyond measure I persecuted the church of God and wasted it. I profited in the Jews' religion above many my equals in mine own nation, being more exceedingly zealous of the traditions of my fathers. So here's the first thing. I think that if you look at what happened to Paul, you understand that before Paul turned his heart to Christ, he, there was other things that he tried. And he didn't just give himself a little bit. You know, sometimes people would say, if you really get into it, if you're really faithful to it, you'll understand Paul was really faithful to religion. He was really faithful to the traditions of his fathers. He had gotten into it 100%. He was completely dedicated. And the Bible tells us here that Paul says he profited. He profited above others, just like today. We have people out there today, and people will sometimes tell you to me, Preacher, did you hear about this thing over here, or this thing over here? And they're, they're growing like gangbusters, and there's hundreds of people flocking to their services. And I don't know, I hope they're not thinking, so what's wrong with you? <laughs> you know? Because quite often, what the people are doing are things that are against the Word of God. Their carnality or their false teaching, or their some other doctrine or false teaching that we cannot embrace. And people say, well, they grow like, well, you know, that was what Paul was doing. Paul was profiting. In his world, he had gone to the best teachers. I had people in, when I was a missionary, too, and th this was the thing that, you know, <laughs> They had some guys that came over there to Hungary that you just would not believe they were missionaries. You just would not believe. And I say that not because they didn't look like missionaries. I mean, they looked nice and they were and sometimes very conservative looking and everything. Nothing wrong in that area. But their doctrine was so far removed from the Bible. 
You'd have to stop and say, man, that, that's crazy. I, I had one guy over there that was working. He was uh, from a Southern Baptist uh, organization or something like that, and he was one of these guys that had just basically given him, he, they didn't call it this, but it's what it was, Gnosticism. He'd given himself over to Gnosticism. He, he believed that Jesus Christ was not literally here, that he was an apparition, that he was a spirit, that he didn't literally die on the cross. They saw Christ there, but that wasn't really Christ. That was just an apparition of Christ. And, and this guy was teaching in the seminary over there. But he had all kinds of degrees. And he had gone to all the universities. And I was talking to a young Hungarian man. And, and, and he was telling me, oh, I, I was sitting, I, I'm in taking brother, uh, or whatever his name was, and the professor, whatever his name was, I don't even remember his name, actually. And I was taking his courses, and he really has, he's going like this. And I said, a big head? And he's like, no, I don't, because he was struggling. Yeah, and he was like, yeah, I guess so, I guess that's it. I think he was saying he really knows a lot. But listen, he was profiting. They had sent him over there. He had a respectable position in a seminary. He was profiting. And some people, that's what they're looking to. Look what I'm profiting. People love me. I, I, I make more money. I had people I had people who talked to me and, and said, hey, I make more money. I was talking to a guy one time. I, we went uh, visiting this, uh, this one guy over, uh, over in another, another town, and we're going there. We're knocking on the door, and they said, how many, how many churches, how many seats you got in your church? I'm like, how many seats we got in our church? I'm like, I don't know. I guess maybe enough to seat 200. Oh, wow, well, that church I go to now can seat a lot more than that. Wow. <laughs> well, just hang up my plaque here. I'm going over there. They got more people. Let me tell you something. That's what Paul was, too. But something changed. Something took him away from that. Something made him feel like that was nothing. Paul said that he was profiting, that he was faithful to the traditions of his fathers. I've met people that just the traditions of their fathers, this is the way we have always been. I see, I see that a lot in Hungary. People there don't like to change. It's very difficult to convince them that this is the way you've been looking at is not according to the Word of God. They don't like the idea. This is the way we've always been. We've always been. This was the way Paul was. He was known as somebody that was exceedingly zealous. He went out there and he was, as Christianity was out there preaching and going out there and God was doing great works, Paul was just the opposite. He was out there chasing after the Christianity, putting them in jail, telling people to go back to the traditions of their fathers. So he tried that. He tried that. He gave a shot. I'm going to be faithful to the, to the, the religion. I'm going to do all the religious things. You know, some of the biggest things we have in this world, some of the biggest religions we have in this world today have no belief in Christ whatsoever. Whatsoever. Hinduism, Islam. They tell me Islam's growing like crazy. Should we forsake Christ? Should we believe in, in reincarnation? Should we, and let's talk about the atheistic side. Look at China, more than a billion people over there. And, and of course, they, there's a lot of people there of different faiths and different ideas, but they would claim that, you know, they're against God. I'm sure there's a lot of people. That's a big country, and there's other countries. I can tell you some other countries in Central Europe that have a very large atheistic population. If, if there's more atheists in the world, does that mean the greater number are there? We should just forsake Christ? Well, you know, this is the way it's always been. Listen, Christ is there to change the way we are. Conversion is when you are dead spiritually and you become alive spiritually. If there hasn't been a change, there's a problem. We're waiting for Kara's baby to come out. And she's had some struggles here. I understand that baby's getting tight in there or something. It's getting... <laughs> 
We pray for her. She's having a few issues there. But when we come, when that baby, right now, she knows that baby's there. She feels it kicking, playing basketball, whatever they're doing in there. But her, even, I'm sure there's a love and a relationship a mother has when she feels that child. I know my, my wife would sit there and watch, and, you know, and all this kind of stuff. And, but when that child comes out, it'll be really different. Then it'll be totally different. And we'll all know that child. And then the whole thing will be different. And then they'll be talking. And then they'll be running. And then they'll be playing. And then they'll be taking your keys to your car. I mean, they, they, you know, these are the things that happen. The, the whole thing completely changes. And it's great when it's like that. But here's the, here's the thing. Before you got saved, the Bible says you were dead spiritually. And then you get saved and you become alive spiritually. There ought to be a dramatic change somehow in your life spiritually when you get saved. Well, I've always been this way. Let Christ change you the way he did Paul. Let him change you. I ain't going to change. Paul did, and he was better for it in the sight of God, and in his own sight as well. Look over in chapter 5. In verse number 3, it says, For I testify. Now he says, I testify. I, I can give you this testimony, because this is the way it was for me. I testify again to every man that is circumcised, that he is a debtor to do the whole law. Christ has become of no effect unto you, whosoever of you are justified by the law, are fallen from grace. For through the Spirit we wait for the hope of righteousness by faith. For in Jesus Christ neither circumcision availeth anything, nor uncircumcision, but faith with worketh by love. Paul had tried the law. He tried to do everything the law said. He tried to be, he was zealous of the law. He was born under the Jewish heritage. You say, well, that's Jew, Judaism. I'm, I'm not Jewish. I don't have any kind of Judaism in my background. Yes, I know, but understand that the Old Testament is all about Judaism. Amen? <laughs> and at the time Paul was living, the New Testament has not been written yet, right? So what was the biblical faith when Jesus was walking in this world? Where did he go after he was born eight days? To the temple. When he was 12 years old and they found him about his father's business, where was he? First Baptist Church of Jerusalem. No, he was in the temple. <laughs> and when Paul went out preaching the word to those people, the Bible says to the Jew first, because they were God's people that God had chosen. And Paul went preaching in the synagogues and in the temple and in the places where those people were to show them that Jesus Christ was the Messiah and that God had come to save them from their sins and that Israel could now see a Redeemer. That's why they were there. He tells us now there's no difference between the Jew and the Greek. For all have become guilty before God. Romans 3.19. Every mouth may be stopped. We all need Christ. But here Paul, he says, I'm going to try the law. I'm going to try to be good. I'm going to try to do everything I can to be a good person. You know how many people I meet out there that are good people? But lost. Because they don't know Jesus Christ. And, and I know that some people are going to stand up there and they're going to say, they're going to stand before the Lord, Matthew chapter 7. They're going to stand before the Lord. There are some people going to be good people and, they, and they're going to say, God, I was good. I did many good works and I did it in your name. I call myself a Christian. Some are even going to claim spiritual powers and gifts. They're going to say, I cast out devils. And Jesus is going to say, depart from me. I never knew you. 
You know, you can even be a religious Baptist and keep all the ideas of being a Baptist. Oh, I go to a, I go to a Christian school. I go, to, I, go, I, I go to a good church that preaches the Word of God. I, 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 I wear my tie on Sunday. I bring my Bible. I sing from the hymn book. I pray sometimes. You can do all those things and still not know Jesus Christ as your Savior. Because it's not by what you do. It's not by what you do. It's putting faith in what he has done. You know, when we are standing in the portals of heaven, and they're talking about the great things that have been done through time and eternity, there is only one that is going to receive glory. That's Jesus Christ. No one's going to stand up and say, well, but I did this. But I did this. Others wouldn't do this, but I did this. Certainly I was more uh, zealous for the law. Only one. It's by faith in Jesus Christ. In other words, it's by faith in what Jesus Christ has done. Look in verse chapter 2 and verse number 16 of Galatians. Knowing that a man is not justified by the works of the law, but by the faith of Jesus Christ. Even we have believed in Jesus Christ, that we might be justified by the faith of Christ and not by the works of the law. For by the works of the law shall no flesh be justified. Do you know what it means to be justified? Justified is they give you permission. You have the right to say you can do something. Brother Fernando's back there. He's planning on going to Brazil. I don't know why. I think he should just stay here all the time. <laughs> but he's planning, you're planning a trip down to Brazil, right? Yeah, next week. Next week. You'll be back for the anniversary though, right? <laughs> oh, man, you better be here because Fernando's not going to be here. I know. You better be here. Bring friends. When he, now, I think Brother Fernando's a nice man. Everybody agree? And he's a fine-looking gentleman, too. I mean, he's got that, that I would never wear a pink tie myself. <laughs> he always comes in here, he's well groomed, his hair is calm, he's wearing a nice suit, except for the days when he comes right from work. But when he comes on Sunday morning, he, he, he comes in here, he's looking nice. Now, if he goes to go to Brazil, and he goes to the airport, and we all go with him to say goodbye, That's right. in the and persuade him to come back by anniversary Sunday, we all go with him, and we say adios or whatever they say in Brazilian. Give him kisses. And here he goes. He goes to get on the airplane. And he goes to get on. And the lady he says, I'd like to get on the airplane now. And the lady says, why should I let you on the airplane? He's like, all of these people love me. Is there anybody else that has this many people? That love them. They went through the security line and bought tickets to other places just so they could see me off because you can't get down any other way. But, yeah. <laughs> but they love me. Well, I'm sorry, sir. That isn't going to do it. Listen, I really sincerely want to go to Brazil. I've wanted to go for quite a while now. I've been thinking about it every day. I am sincere as I could be. I believe I need to be in Brazil. Well, sir, that isn't going to happen either. <laughs> I got baptized by a Brazilian. <laughs> I 
I'm a big B, Brazilian. <laughs> no. What do you want? Ticket. Ticket. Well, I don't have the money to buy a ticket. Tickets to Brazil are just too much money. But you know something, Mr. Fernando? Somebody else has bought the ticket for you. All you got to do is retrieve them. Well, I don't want to do that. I have my own way. I'll walk. I'll swim. Maybe I'll take a motor scooter. <laughs> Wouldn't it be a lot easier to take the ticket, Mr. Fernando? You know, I think you're right. I think if I'm going to go to Brazil right now, I think the only thing I can do is take that ticket. That's justification. That's what Jesus Christ has done for you. You can't be justified by what you've done. But I've done this! But you don't understand, I've had this spiritual experience. I've had this good work. I've had this tradition of my fathers. I had, Paul said, I have tried all these things. I was as zealous as I could possibly be, and I found no hope. What happened, Paul? Chapter 3. Verse number six, even as Abraham believed God, and it was accounted to him for righteousness. Know ye therefore that they which are of faith, the same are the children of Abraham. And the scripture foreseeing that God would justify the heathen, that's you and I, through faith, preached before the gospel unto Abraham, saying, In thee shall all the nations be blessed. So then they which be of faith are blessed with faithful Abraham. Well, that goes back pretty far. That's one of the real early characters in the Bible. Abraham. You mean God has been preaching faith in him for salvation for some 4,000 years? If you haven't gotten it, you're just behind the times. This is what God says. It is not by what you do. It's what Christ has done. And then when you realize that this is what Christ has done, and that you realize that he died for you, that you might be saved, that he gave himself, that he was the only righteous sacrifice of God. You could not do it by the traditions of your fathers. You couldn't do it by your religion. You couldn't do it by your, your being justified and keeping the law. You couldn't do it by any of those things. And so Christ had to become a man just so that he could die for you because there was no other way for you to be saved. That was more love than Paul had ever experienced. So Paul said, what can I do for Christ? Man. You mean I'm saved forever? Yeah. By putting my faith in Christ, yep. Wow. But don't I have to do, no. It's not by what you do. But what if I do that? It's not by what you do. But what if other people see me do that? It's not by what you do. It's by what he has done for you. Where is your faith? It must be in Christ. It must be in Christ. So here, Paul gets it. And he realizes. And the Bible tells us in chapter 2, he says... I am crucified with Christ. What does that mean? 
This is the extent of Paul's dedication. To say that you're crucified with Christ doesn't literally mean that he crucified himself, that he killed himself, that he had a plan to take his own life. It, he, because he says, yet I live. I am crucified with Christ, yet I live. Yet not I, but Christ liveth in me. He's not just, he's talking about taking that out of my life, which prohibits Christ from having all of me. Sometimes Christ has us, but he doesn't get us all. We get all of him, but he doesn't get all of us. Sometimes he gets us on Sunday only. Sometimes he gets us at certain times, but not at other times. Sometimes he gets us when we're in fellowship with this group of people, but not when we're in fellowship with this group of people. Sometimes he gets us when these people can see us, but when those people can't see us, he doesn't get us that time. Crucifying ourselves is putting to death that which is against Christ and that which prohibits him from having all of us. See, that was the thing. Sometimes I have people, it happens probably more than you'd realize, as much as I preach about it, and there's probably somebody sitting here this morning who's going to say the same thing to me someday. Well, I'm going to go over to this church now because... They don't tell me I can't do this. They don't preach against this. It's okay to do this. I've had people say that. I said, you know, I don't think I've ever even preached on that. But that's what they say. In other words, I have sin they accept. I have some carnality that's okay with them. They don't judge me. You know, the Bible says in Romans chapter 8 and verse 7, because the carnal man mind is at enmity against God, for it is not subject to the law of God, neither indeed can be. So then they that are in the flesh can not please God. You can't please God in the flesh. Doesn't mean you're not saved. I have sons here. I've got one here. I've got one on the camera. And one here. They're surrounding us. And sometimes they're really good and they make me proud. And sometimes they're stinkers. And would you believe sometimes they even fight with one another? embarrassing but you know something sometimes they're not pleasing to me but they're still my son and I still love them and I wish they'd be more pleasing when they're not sometimes we're not pleasing to God we're still a child of God but see here's the difference in motivation it's not necessarily what you get. When you're pleasing to God, I believe God blesses your life, but it's not just that. Let's put that aside for a minute. Let's look at Paul's motivation. Sometimes I think that's my motivation. I want to be pleasing to God because I want his blessings in my life. God tells us that. He, he, he uses that as an example in Proverbs chapter 3. Trust in the Lord. You know, if you give, God blesses you. Give and it shall be given unto you in the book of Luke. There are things that God tells us. So that is part of motivation. But Paul's motivation was different. Paul gave himself to the Lord to love him back. Because he wanted to love the Lord back. His motivation was to be pleasing to Christ. And if we look just for a moment over the book of Colossians, General Electric Power Company... Glenn eats paper clips. I don't know why, but Galatians, Ephesians, Philippians, Colossians. Colossians chapter 1, 
and we've used this verse a lot in our teaching in Colossians, verse number 13, who hath delivered us from the power of darkness and hath translated us into the kingdom of his dear son in whom we have redemption through his blood, even the forgiveness of sins. That's what Paul found in Christ, the forgiveness of sins. Not the weighing out of sins. It's not a balanced thing. You won't get into heaven with one single sin on your blotter, but Christ is able to forgive you. He's able to cleanse you. He's able to wash it all away. It's Christ. But he has already delivered us from the power of darkness. I'm not waiting for the trumpet for the, the deliverance. I'm not waiting for the, the end of the tribulation. I'm not waiting for the second coming. Christ has already delivered us from the power of darkness. Darkness has no power over the children of light. Wake up, he says, thou that sleepest. That's what he's talking about. Over in chapter 3, what's it talking about crucifying? Verse number 5. Mortify, therefore, your members which are upon the earth, fornication, uncleanness, inordinate affection, evil concupiscence, and covetousness, which is adultery. I want what others have. How can you do that? You have the power through Christ. And he wants us to put on the things of Christ. Verse number 13. For bearing one another and forgiving one another. If any man have a quarrel against any, even as Christ forgave you, so also do ye. And above all these things, put on charity, which is the bond of perfectness or completeness or maturity. And let the peace of God rule in your hearts. What is it that tells me I'm a mature Christian? I've been in church for so many years. I do this, I do that. It is your love for others. It is your forgiveness for others. It is the degree to which you are willing to humble yourself because of what Christ has done for you to lift up other people. Forgive, love, and unify. But you can do that before because of Christ. But you know what? Can I tell you something? Our flesh does not want to do that. Our flesh does not want to do that. Because you know what he said to me? Because he doesn't have any right to talk to me. Because who do you think you are? Sean's nervous and I wasn't even pointing at him. <laughs> right? with it. Listen, our flesh doesn't like it. Even when we don't know the person, we're driving down the road and they cut in front of us and they probably had the right of way. We're already ready to smash our car into them and drive them off the bridge, you know? And they would burn and die and crash into a fiery grave and we'd sit there on the edge of the bridge going, ha, 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 ha! Cut me off, will you? I mean, you know. We're pretty selfish people in general. What changes us, that change again comes back. Christ. Christ has got to change you. Now, I know you're thinking, what is it, if Christ could completely use my life, what would he do? And I'm going to show you three quick things. I won't be long. Turn over to Acts chapter 14. Here's Paul. This is Paul's testimony. Acts chapter 14 tells us the story of Paul going into Lystra, preaching the gospel. They thought that he and Barnabas were gods. They tried to worship him. Paul stopped him. Paul preached to him. They took up stones because the Jews from Antioch and Iconium came over to try to persuade the people to stone Paul. Let's pick up in verse number 19. And there came thither certain Jews from Antioch and Iconium who pers persuaded the people and having stoned Paul drew him out of the city, supposing he had been dead. Howbeit, as the disciples stood around about him, he rose up and came into the city. And the next day he departed with Barnabas to Derby. And then they preached the gospel to the city and taught many. They returned again to Lystra and Iconium and Antioch. 
Paul was stoned. Not the bad kind of stoned like we would do with drugs. He was stoned by real rocks. He was dragged out of the city because they thought he was dead. He got up. He went back into the city to preach the gospel. These people threw rocks at him. I've heard people say, well, don't you get the message? They don't want to hear it. You go because it's God's calling to go. He said, go into all the world and preach the gospel unto every creature. One of the things I believe that Paul did because of Christ had complete control of him is so winning became more important than life itself. It became the most important. Paul was even willing to die that others might know Christ. Think about that the next time you hear somebody say, well, I want to go to this church because I feel better about the way they dress or the music or the lights or the seats. I'm willing to die that somebody else might get saved. If it's so good, let them get people somewhere else besides the ones that this pastor has labored over and prayed and won to the Lord. And some of you folks and have gotten saved to this altar. Let them go somewhere else and find them. There's a whole ocean of people out there that need the gospel. Amen. They don't need to fish in my aquarium. Let me tell you something. Church is a wonderful thing for fellowship. And we have some great fellowship. But God wasn't impressed by the get-togethers they had in the church in Jerusalem. Or Antioch. God wrote about the times that they went out and sacrificially won others to get to Christ. Lighthouse Baptist Church, if Christ could completely use our lives, we would be soul winners. We would have a desire to see people get saved, and we wouldn't even care what others thought, and we wouldn't even care if they tried to kill us, which won't happen. But we wouldn't care. We'd be an avid soul winner. Chapter 16. Verse 22. Here was Paul in Philippi, again, preaching the word and being persecuted for it, and they beat him. Verse number 22. And the multitude rose up together against them, and the magistrates rent off their clothes and commanded to beat them. And when they had laid many stripes upon them, they cast them into prison, charging the jailer to keep them safely, who, having received such a charge, thrust them into the inner prison and made their feet fast in stocks. You know... My feet hurt me all the time. Preacher, I'd come to church, but I like to put them on a cushion on Sunday morning and watch the football game. Try locking them up in wooden stocks. Try sitting in a smelly prison. Boy, preacher, you preach a long time. It's hot in here. Try doing it with a beating on your back and open wounds and rats, and bugs, and mold, and other smelly prisoners, and no, no kind of bathroom, and no running water, and no lights. And what was Paul doing? Singing praises unto the Lord. If Christ could completely use our lives, when we were pain, in pain or persecuted, we would still praise Christ. I think that's what we do. One more, chapter 27. Verse number 20. We're looking at your Clydon came in this storm and blew this ship off course. Paul told them, don't do it. God told me not to do it. But they didn't listen to him. They listened to somebody else. 
Who's going to listen to a Baptist preacher anyways? Amen? Verse number 20, And when neither sun nor stars in many days appeared, and no small tempest lay on us, all hope that we should be saved was then taken away. But after long absence, Paul stood forth in the midst of them and said, Sirs, ye should have hearkened unto me, and not have loosed from Crete, and to have gained this harm and loss. And now I exhort you, be of good cheer, for there shall be no loss of any man's life among you but the ship. For there stood by me this night the angel of God, whose I am and whom I serve, saying, Fear not, Paul, thou must be brought before Caesar, and lo, God hath given thee all of them that sail with thee. Wherefore, sirs, be of good cheer, for I believe in God. What an amazing thing. Here was a man that was on a ship, and there was more than a couple hundred people on the ship. It was a huge ship, and they're on the storm for days and days and days. And they've been there for so many days, and all hope that they should be saved is lost. But he still believes in God. If Christ, Lighthouse Baptist Church, could completely use our lives when everyone else was discouraged and life seemed homeless, hopeless, we would still have faith in God. And you know what? We're almost there. Because there are a lot of people that feel this world is hopeless right now. You say, what should we do? We should say, cheer up and tell them we believe in God and we should mean it. And we should be cheer, of cheer ourselves because of the one who loved us and gave himself for us. Let's bow ourselves in prayer this morning. Maybe God's spoken to your heart today.